Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're investigating how assisted evolution is increasing the resilience of corals in the Ruth Gates Lab at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is internationally famous for this cutting edge coral research. We'll talk to the Gates Lab project manager, genetics and microscopy expert, graduate student researchers, lab assistants, and a high school intern all playing a part in understanding and ensuring a future for coral reefs on our planet Earth. So everything that we're doing in the lab, from the conditioning to selective breeding to uh, modifying symbioses, that is all working towards finding the most resilient coral that we can that can withstand future climate change. When your temperature increases in your body and it goes up, just by a couple degrees, you feel a big difference and you feel sick. That's what's happening to the oceans and happening to these corals. We feel that if we don't do anything now, then there potentially won't be corals left. Different types, different species of coral can associate with different types of algae, and there's just a few that they will actually take up. We can actually change that relationship and hope to make hardier, and more resilient corals that will not expel their algae and will not really bleach in warmer temperatures. All of our species in Hawaii that we work with that are big coral reef builders, they all are born with their symbionts from their parent. They're actually passed on in order to um, be able to change the symbionts that they associate with, you have to actually get rid of those symbionts with still keeping the corals alive. Not many people have done this before, so it's really exciting. It's really high risk research. We're not sure if it's going to work. If you have a reef that's bleached and you could just sprinkle all the algae into the ocean and they could take up that algae, algae can reproduce really rapidly, much more rapidly than corals. So they will reproduce within the, the coral tissue cells and they could survive with that more resilient algae. So that's kind of the big picture idea of it would be a really easy fix if it works. And with our experiments, we have to get every single last red dot gone or else that algae can recolonize that coral tissue. So you have to take that coral down to a really unhappy state. Really unhappy and then get it back um, to a happy state right away. So this is what's called a laser scanning confocal microscope. It takes high resolution pictures of live organisms. Here on the microscope, we have an environmental chamber. We can adjust temperature and oxygen levels to create the ocean conditions of the future. The corals that look more visually bland to your eye, like the brown, I find look the most vibrant under the microscope, like under ultraviolet light. I know it's very strange. Here we have a postal opera. And that's a kind of coral. It is, a coral that's found here in Hawaii. We just taken a little snippet off a, a colony. And I'm gonna load it right onto the stage here. Okay, so now I'm just gonna locate the coral and focus on it. So this is the coral that we have under the microscope. Yes, yeah, so this is the Postal Opera coral. And we're here we're looking at it at 2.5 times magnification. And so we're able to see a closer look here of the individual polyps, which we can see the, the ring of tentacles that surrounds the polyp's mouth. And these tentacles are basically like arms for the coral that they're able to reach out and grab small animals or zooplankton that's floating by and bring them into their mouth and eat them. This is the same type of coral, Postal Opera, under basically ultraviolet light. What we see here is we can more clearly see the symbionts, how they're distributed in the coral. So the symbionts are now fluorescing red. Oh. So they have chlorophyll in them and chlorophyll fluoresces red under ultraviolet light. And we can also see what we didn't see before is this green here. So this is green fluorescent protein that's in the coral. And on the end of their tentacles, you can see kind of a bluish color. Those are the, the stinging cells. This is one animal, even though it has multiple polyps. And each of these polyps is genetically identical. So they're actually clones of each other. And you can actually see on top of the coral, there's many organisms that are living right on top of the coral tissue. There's a, quite an elaborate ecosystem 
involved in one coral. We do see this quite frequently, organisms who live right on top of the coral tissue, but we don't know a lot about them. So now I'm going to get even closer. Oh, so wow. this is at 10 times magnification. Now you can really see the symbionts. Yeah, so now you can really see those single cell symbionts. And you can see the stinging tentacle, or the stinging cells on the end of their tentacles. And you can also see, it looks like they have stinging cells around their mouth as well. And the coral's actually spitting out what's called the mesentery, which is the, coral, the lining of the coral stomach. When coral colonies start growing close to each other, they'll have coral wars, and they'll spit out their mesentery on each other to Digest destroy the, the coral other ones? Mix? Yes. No way. Is that like a competitive? Why are they fighting under your microscope? I don't think it's fighting under my microscope, under the microscope, but uh, I think it's just maybe a little unhappy under the, stress. under the light. Yeah, yeah, so it's a little stress. So it's kind of a natural stress response, and we're seeing that here. Here's a opera that's that has been through a major bleaching event. And when you look at it with the naked eye, it looks white. It's not moving as much. M many of the symbionts are gone, though it does still have some left. This is a Leptastria. It actually just spit larvae out of its mouth. These are Tastria larvae, and you can see inside they have symbionts with them. So the babies are sent on their journey with symbionts inside. This is a close-up of one of those uh, planulas, one of the, the, the larvae, And you can see the symbionts inside, and you can see its oral cavity, which will turn into its mouth. And also, it out, spit out a couple of symbionts in the process. <laughs> I did an experiment. I increased the temperature by a couple degrees, and within about seven days, the coral was expelling symbionts very rapidly. So this is day one before I raise the temperature. This is how the coral is behaving initially. This is about three days into the experiment. I've raised the, the environment by a couple degrees, and you can see the polyps are now retracted in. It's still moving, there's still quite a bit of movement, but you can see what's happening here is some of the symbionts are being expelled now. After seven days at an elevated temperature, you can see a lot of the movement is now gone. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. talking about a, a coral, a Montebra, that is, um, it's releasing eggs and sperm, and you said broadcast spawning, so going yeah. out into the water. So these Montebra capitata, they're the rice coral that are pretty dominant in Kaneohe Bay. They will release these bundles that they packaged inside of them already. And these bundles are full of eggs and sperm. And the eggs actually have that symbiodinium, that algae already inside of them. So they're all packaged, kind of ready to go. They get released around the full moon in uh, May, June, July, or June, July, and August. What I've been looking at is quality of the gametes, so the sperm and the eggs that these corals that did or did not bleach are producing. And so far what I've found um, is looking just specifically at the eggs. So here on this screen, we have eggs that were from an individual bundle. So right here, we were able to uh, collect each individual bundle went into one of these tubes. So they create this care package, a bundle. And within this care package are your gametes, your eggs and your sperm, and they're ready to go. So here we would 
uh, collect the bundles, let them break apart, and then we fix them. So that way we know how many eggs are being packaged in this bundle, and then how large are these eggs. So we can potentially look for differences over time, because this is a metric or a trait that has been measured in multiple studies. So we can look at what the traits were 20 years ago and see how much that has changed. I have found that in the literature we are seeing a decline in eggs packaged per bundle and a slight increase in their size. So even though there are less of them, they're becoming larger. And that might be to increase the surface area so that a sperm actually will interact with this egg. Here we have the early stages of the embryos. Eggs that were newly fertilized, this is about two hours after introducing the sperm to the eggs. And so what we have here is one egg that looks like it hasn't been fertilized at all. And then here's an early stage where it looks like it's a two cell going into four cells. Here's a really nice picture of one that is a four cell stage. So you get these four right here. This is about an eight to 16, eight to 16. And so this gives us an idea of those that are have successfully um, fertilized. We can look at proportionalities. And then we can also look at rate of development as well. So it's another week after this that they'll settle and then metamorph into a little tiny polyp, like a little coral. Depending on the currents, depending on the tides, the winds, all of that, this uh, pack of larvae or this cohort could be taken completely offshore somewhere, and they could actually stay in a larval stage for a couple of months. They will delay their metamorphosis if there isn't a suitable substrate to settle on. So seven to 10 days is the fastest. So the seven to 10 is like, oh, we got a window of opportunity. <laughs> Let's get these settled. We don't know if there is any filter going on where if you have an adult that has a mixture of symbiodinium types or clades, if they're going to kind of cherry pick or figure out which one or somehow pass, which one's gonna be most suitable. We don't know if there's any type of selection going on in that process. There is a trade-off in functionality. So for instance, clay D is a really nice example of being tolerant against high temperatures. However, they live in corals that tend to grow slowly or more slowly. And then you have a clade C that tends to let corals grow more faster. So some sort of fuel in there and what they're providing allows the coral to grow faster. However, it's temperature sensitive. So there are these trade-offs going on. So if you have a composition, if you have a coral that's composed of a mixture of them, what does that actually mean for their functionality? Are they a jack of all trades or is there a price to pay? We're not sure. We're processing coral samples from a heat stress experiment with lab assistant, Brenna Carroll. So right now we're um, doing airbrushing, which is the removal of the tissue from the coral skeleton. And then from that, what we call slurry, <laughs> we can do lots of things. We can uh, do DNA extractions, qPCRs, things to see like what was on the corals or how like stressed out they were, things like that. So I'm just gonna get the gloves on. I'm just gonna grab our coral nubbin. It's kind of it's kind of violent and messy, but. Just to start out. Whoop. And the bag gets in the way, but. You can see how the skeleton is exposed now, and all that tissue has come off. I am putting it into a falcon tube. And now, since it's super goopy, it's not uniform all the way through, I'm gonna take a syringe to pulverize the tissue, and that will get it nice and uniform for the samples. How is a syringe gonna pulverize the tissue? I guess I'll find out. Doesn't seem like something that would work, but pump it right down in. Oh, I see. Yeah, and that motion really breaks all the gunk up. Yeah. I then. can smell it. Oh yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> it can be strong. <laughs> so now, I'm gonna Fill it up to 10 milliliters. And then I'm just gonna invert it a few times. And then I aliquot it into four tubes and um, these can be used for whatever processing of the samples. When you work with corals, you can learn a lot about their physiology by doing something like airbrushing because you can tell like exactly how thick their tissue is. 
here we are at the wet lab. This is the outdoor part of it. We have all the holding tanks here and a few more over here. All these tanks belong to different people doing different experiments. The volunteers that came over during the night, their job is to sit in front of the bucket and flower pots, wait until the coils spawn. Then once they start spitting out those little tiny egg bundles or egg and sperm bundles, you use a pipette. Just suck it up. Ginger, you gotta do it very gingerly. If you break it, they have this poison, which is almost like a self-destruct mechanism. Not quite sure what it's for, but can't break it, so there's that pressure. Being a scientist isn't a wake up at nine o'clock, leave work at five o'clock thing. It's really 24 seven. You just gotta do whatever your test subject is doing. If the coral doesn't wanna spawn until one o'clock in the night, you have to stay there and watch it until one o'clock in the night. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. conditioning the juvenile corals to handle a thermal stress event in the future. We're looking at two different factors that maybe will affect their resilience to a thermal stress. One of those is temperature, the temperature that they are being reared or that they're growing at in this early life stage, and their nutrition. Corals have two primary sources of nutrition. And normally when we talk about coral energetics and coral nutrition, we think of the symbiont that is providing them carbon through photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. um, but corals also are really voracious predators of plankton. Um, of any size class of plankton. And what they do is feed heterotrophically and that heterotrophic carbon contributes to their energy budget, but it also helps to move that nitrogenous and phosphorus waste to the symbiont to help the symbionts grow as well. That heterotrophic nutrition is really important, but we don't really understand how it affects corals. So what we're doing in this experiment is providing juvenile corals with heterotrophic nutrition to see how it affects their growth, their survivorship, and whether they are better able to handle a bleaching stress in the future. We go drag a net right here out in the bay and we filter that down to a certain size that we want and that contains plankton in the form of copepods, phytoplankton, zoea, any kind of larvae or any kind of debris that's out in the bay in that size. We collect, we clean it, and then we just provide it to them in the tanks. And so, they just eat it up. Yeah, their, their polyps come out, they grab it with their tentacles and they just fully digest that plankton. They'll spit out some of the waste from that, but most of that carbon and all of those nutrients go into the holobiont to help them gain energy and grow and fuel those symbionts. The temperature in these tanks fluctuates naturally higher during the day and cooler at night, which we can program with a computer system. What we have here are ambient and cool. So ambient is replicating just what we see in the bay throughout the day. The cool tanks are just about a degree and a half Celsius cooler than that. And what we found was that uh, having that heterotrophic nutrition source really made them resilient to bleaching. Um, and that there was some effect too on their bleaching response based on the temperature that they were at for that first month of their life. The type of nutrition they're receiving and the temperature have really interesting impacts on each other. If you're malnourished as a young child, there are negative impacts a lot longer into your life. So we're trying to see if there's something similar in corals where if we can help them at the very start of their life, prepare for a thermal stress, if that can last a lot longer. And they're also really cute. So we have, <laughs> we have a bunch in here. So they're all in these little circular plastic tiles. Um, and this is where the larvae have attached to those tiles and they've settled. Or, and what that means is they've turned from the swimming larvae, little worm looking stage, into an actual developed polyp. And then that polyp grows and divides and becomes a little colony. So what that looks like is something like this where you get these uh, patches of coral oh, polyp tissue. Yeah. And so you can see this one, which is really exciting, has a small branch. So these are three months old now. And to see them branching like that, you only see in the treatments where they're receiving that heterotrophic nutrition. 
Okay, so we predict that they would grow faster, that they would have more lipids or fats, so we're measuring that as well, um, and that they would have thicker tissues, which we're measuring with the confocal microscope. We predict that these would be best suited to handle a thermal stress, and then we look at a, a treatment like ambient unfed, where they're at a higher temperature and they're not receiving that nutrition. So that group may not be as well prepared to handle thermal stress. So you'll notice these are lighter in color and they're a lot smaller. So here's a couple here on the side. Oh, wow. Um, and you see, it's just not as easy to find them. Here's a small one right here. So all of these started out the exact same way. They're from the same parents, from the same reef, but we're seeing them grow in much different ways just based on the environment that they're in. Welcome to uh, the microscope room here in the wet lab. And what we're gonna look at is uh, some of the baby corals that we've taken from that experiment in the other room that we saw and look at them up close so that you can really understand how different their growth is and how cool they are at this life stage. And what we're looking at is one of those plugs that came out from the tank. And this area here is all a juvenile coral colony. In some cases, at the larval stage, when they settle in day one, their one polyp, they settle and fuse together. And we don't really know why some will fuse together and why some choose to settle separately. So this is a good example of where these two settled separately but next to each other. Um, and in other colonies, they actually fuse right next to each other where you can get dozens, up to 20 larvae that fuse into one colony from day one. But you can tell genetically that it's not identical. So that would be called a chimera. Um, where you have two genotypes forming one fused colony. And we're just starting to get an understanding that that may be actually more relevant than we think it is. Um, when we traditionally think of a coral colony, we say this coral colony is, is one genotype, one parent. Um, but it may actually be that if we're seeing larvae that are siblings, fusing together, um, or if you're seeing larvae from different parents fusing together, you may actually be getting a different total genetic structure of that colony than we really realized. The next experiment that I wanna show you is looking more at a fine scale diversity assessment of what happens when you put larvae of different parents together. What we've been doing is testing uh, in a microplate format, so using these 96 wool plates, we're able to put different combinations of genotypes together and look at how long they survive, when they settle, and if they can handle a thermal stress. Does genotypic diversity, meaning you have not just siblings of larvae, but you have them from multiple parents, does that diversity confer some sort of functional advantage? Do they survive better? Do they settle quicker? Do they settle differently? Do they fuse? Do they not fuse? Um, do they handle the thermal stress better? These are all brand new questions that we can ask doing these types of things with coral larvae. But the trick is that we have to know what genotype they are and who they came from. Larvae all look the same. And it's really hard to tell them apart unless you can tag them with something where you can say, I know that this is genotype A and this is genotype B. And so we're doing that in a way that actually we just kind of played with and we found something fun that really worked very well. And that's just food coloring. We wanted to dye larvae a certain color so that we could have multiple genotypes that are multiple colors where it's easy for us to tell who's who. We put larvae in these dishes with different colors and we let them sit for 12 to 20 hours in these different colors. Each of these is uh, an individual larvae and each of the colors is from individual parents. So you can already see that there's red, green, blue, and yellow, and that those colors are very different. So if you were to look at the plate just with your eyes through a microscope, we're able to say that genotype A or genotype B or genotype C is surviving differently than others. They retain the color for three to four days. After that, they lose the color. So once they settle, we'll be able to map them and then keep track of them over longer periods of time. But while they're swimming and kind of mixing up and around with each other, it's otherwise hard for us to really know who's there. And they really don't seem to have any difference in survivorship or settlement. So this is potentially a really powerful tool for us to do this and do it in high replication if we can do it in these 96 well plates. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds. Help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher.